Then my name is Taku Suzuki. I'm director of the International <coughs> Studies Program at Denison University. Hi, uh, I'm Sudesh Mantilika. Uh, I'm a faculty member uh, at the Department of Fine Arts at the University of Peradini in Sri Lanka. Uh, and also the, I'm the, also the choreographer and a performer of My Devil Dance. My name is Yalani Dream. I'm a performing artist, storyteller, facilitator, cultural worker, and I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm Umeshi. I'm a Denison alum, um, and I'm a visiting lecturer at the University of Visual and Performing Arts, and I run my own dance company. Hi, I'm uh, Saumi Lienagi. Um, currently, I'm working as the dean of the faculty of uh, Graduate Studies, University of Visual and Performing Arts, Colombo. Um, yeah. Um, and I'm Christina Welsh. I'm in the yes, department. Please. Of I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, dancers, yes. come. Yes. Oh, please. Yeah, have a seat. Yeah, come. Department of History, oh, Worcester, that's, right. that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, so I want to have a couple of questions to all of the performance, performance today. So the, one of the themes of the, tonight's performance is that the relationship between f performance arts and colonialism, anti-colonial nationalism, uh, decolonization, post-colonialism, and Sri Lanka's case, of course, post-colonial condition means that this decades-long civil war between two factions, Sinhalis and, and Tamil. How do your performances relate to, you know, at least in your mind, this Sri Lanka's history of colonialism, post-colonialism, and, and the contemporary situations? So would you comment on that, how your performances relate to the history of Sri Lanka in one way or the other? Anyone? Who wants to? <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I can uh, start it off. Um, <clears throat> I, I, for a long time, I was, uh, I was, I began to reject national. Well, okay, let's start. When I was young, I was actually raised in Tamil nationalism. So my family's personal story fits very well and neatly into a dominant Tamil nationalist narrative. So my, my father had um, uh, been in the midst of the massacres in the late 50s in Sri Lanka, so he witnessed uh, Tamil pe people being gasoline and burned in front of him. Um, he was a part of the youth movement in, uh, in Jaffna. My mother's family, my grandfather had been part of the Satyagra, peaceful, nonviolent movement, and the peaceful gatherings, they were tear gassed by the, the police. And so, um, you know, uh, my father had an expectation or that he would have access to higher education, but as a Tamil, uh, was, wasn't able to access that. So that's a very um, a dominant uh, Tamil nationalist narrative that our family, uh, also people from a more, that, that education, Peace is also people who have access to so more exploited castes within our community that uh, were, didn't have that same expectation of being able to have access to higher education as well. So mm. um, then uh, it was actually through friendship. Um, my, uh, one of my best friends, uh, I met her in Ohio, actually. She was a student at Oberlin University in 2000. Um, is uh, the niece of Neelan Tiruchelbum, who was a Tamil politician who had been assassinated by the LTTE. And we grew uh, a very close friendship, and that opened my mind to thinking about uh, a higher standard of liberation for Tamil people. And when I moved into that space, I started to reject all forms of nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, I, as, I, as a feminist, as a queer person, I just felt like I started to associate, because of the context of Sri Lanka, uh, nationalism as a very oppressive, singular, homogenous force that was replicating this colonial homogeneity. 
And then, um, but then I, I grew again because of my engagement with decolonial uh, nationalist movements on these lands, specifically indigenous and black liberation movements. And I began to think, okay, what is it that I can recuperate from decolonial nationalism? Mm. And I had a friend who also uh, was engaged with the ND movement in the Philippines who also asked me those questions. Yalini, is there something to recuperate from decolonial nationalist movements? Mm. You know, can we be critical but not throw it all away? And so then I started to find myself in a more complicated um, space thinking about these different ideas. So that's where I, the trajectory that happened politically and intellectually. But ultimately as a performer, for me, creativity is a spiritual practice. So I also am approaching things from um, something that has also been influenced by indigenous frameworks on these lands around being a a descendant of ancestors and an ancestor of descendants and really thinking about things in terms of hundreds and thousands of years. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so for me, I, I, instead of, I, I, I really don't want to be engaged in a reactive politic. I re- I, I, to me, it's very important that I have a vision. And my vision is to shift human economies from extraction, exploitation, uh, domination, and war to uh, interdependence, love, um, um, creativity, nourishment, and what I think is beautiful about all of our communities on the island and hold on to our hospitality, our love, our openness, our spirituality, our mysticism, our, our magic, and, and really uh, fight against uh, you know, these, uh, these oppressive negative forces and move towards this, um, this governance for all and this vision of of inclusion and for me what I understand spiritually as love and so um, that's that's how you know that's where I see my work um, moving through and aesthetically it's a mix of imagining and wondering about what has been lost especially when we think about Tamil communities on the island and um, the ways in which our artistic expressions have been manipulated not only through colonialism but through nationalist propaganda, Mm. Um, the ways in which also the Indian influence (laughs) of Abhinathiam really took out the erotic from um, and also the pluralism of like the different dances and that came from all the different types of villages Mm -hmm. and um, and so I, I bring back the circle, you know, because that was also associated with the erotic and was um, kind of, um, you know, uh, what I imagine has and what I understand to have been, um, you know, removed from uh, our communities, you know, um, because we shouldn't be bare-breasted or we shouldn't be sexual and we shouldn't be, um, you know, all of these things, especially as women. Mm. So, yeah. That's the, the that's a taste. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I, I have the like a, the other side of the story. Mm. Um, you know, I I'm from I represent like although I don't like it, but um, the Sinhala majority. So I grew up as a Sinhala you know uh, uh, person in 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 Sri Lanka Sinhala communities, and then growing up like uh, you know I started to learn dance. Uh, at the age of like uh, like in grade five, so we were exposed to the, this Kandyan dance as the national dance of mm-hmm. the country. So we were like, okay, this is our national dance. Let's let's practice in that. And then uh, you know I was really good at dance. And then you know after entering the universities and like you know when you know uh, started to question the history of the dance and the notion of the dance, then I I started to see you know there are like. It's not just singular dance. It's there are when you see the dance that you see different cultural influences, mm. you know, uh, coming together. But we don't talk about that. We just interpret this as a singular mm-hmm. dance. And so then, uh, you know, in my graduate studies, I started to question more about the practice. And then, then I started to see like you know, it, it goes back to the colonialism as mm-hmm. well. So the the colonial appropriation of the dance, and then how the nationalism, singular nationalism, took that. A symbol and elevated as a singular dance, and then you know, 2016, uh, you know, this disturbing story w- w- um, heard when the you know the, the in Sri Lanka the the northern and uh, the eastern part is mostly uh, 
the Tamil majority and the southern is more more singular majority and uh, the Jaffna University which is like in in uh, uh, in, northern. Uh, in northern part of the country um, uh, in the Jaffna University there, there was a uh, celebration uh, of like uh, fresh students were you know entering the university so there was the student was celebrating that event and there were Singhala and Tamil both students uh, you know uh, organizing this event so the Singhala student decided to bring the Kandian dance group because they thought, okay, so this is the kind of singular national symbol. So they wanted to uh, have that in that ceremony. <clears throat> but the Tamil students were against that mm -hmm. because they, they thought, okay, the, they, so, so this is a singular dance. We don't want the singular dance. Mm -hmm. But the dancers were there, then there was a clash. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, you know, end up in like violence mm -hmm. among students. So uh, this was really disturbing <coughs> for me like, because, you know, because both singular and Tamil students were, did, didn't know that we sh in this dance form we had the shared heritage when you go back to the history mm. and it was it was shaped by colonialism and nationalism and so that's why where I felt like you know uh, rather than just writing my dissertation I, I as an artist I, I, I want to create something mm. to reach out to more audience about this story like history and and also the how the dancers were uh, you know um, you know, the going through the colonial exhibitions and like the objectification of dancers, that history. And then, uh, you know, then I started to question like, although the colonialism is over, is the oppression is over? Is the, because it's, aren't we living in a neo-colonial condition uh, with, you know, IMFA, World Bank and corporations and still governing the, you know, shaping the policies of the country mm. and, you know, uh, so the, those questions, and and also like you know uh, you know I have the different uh, 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 rendering of the performance. So, so what I've done today was like I, I want to you know uh, recently I was thinking like how the nationalism uh, you know becoming this heritage and becoming a beast and then you know like could attack anyone mm. uh, regardless of the ethnicity. So this. The, the critique of nationalism and, and, and idea was like uh, was in my mind recently. So. Um, so coming from both of them, I'm actually both a Sinhalese and a Tamil. Um, and I obviously grew up in a country that was clearly politically very divided along these ethnic lines. Um, and growing up, I was always sort of told I need to choose my identity. I needed to be either Sinhalese or a Tamil. I couldn't be both. And in institutions like schools, they told me, you can't choose, you can't go into a Buddhist um, religion class and a Hinduism religion class. You have to pick. And I remember telling um, as a young child, no, I want to go to all. You know, like, that w that's what my parents taught me, so why can't I follow all? Um, and I kept being pressured right through my childhood, sort of like trying to choose this identity. Um, and movement and dance was my only way of sort of like not being able to talk about that. It was a way to just escape all these identities, in, in, you know, completely. Um, and it wasn't obviously until I came to sort of Denison in my undergrad where I realized that I don't have to sort of claim one identity. I can claim, you know, multiple identities at the same time. And mm. I sort of started rejecting this idea of, like, I'm Sri Lankan and this is what I am and I'm Sinhalese and I'm Tamil. And I didn't want to sort of make those labels and those statements. Um, and so a lot of my work and a lot of the performance that I create is, I guess, artistically I'm interested in seeing the similarities and differences um, in people across the world and sort of understanding how we can bridge those differences more and more. Um, so a lot of the, especially the performance you see tonight is actually, it was inspired by the protest that took place in Sri Lanka that was against the government, um, where the president wanted to overthrow the prime minister unconstitutionally. Um, and I was part of the protest, you know, and I, there were Tamils there, there were Sinhalese there, there were, you know, there were Muslims there, there were so many different groups of people, and you could see how they were using their bodies to express this change. And it got me thinking about, you know, how are we using our bodies, you know, to fight against, either against this notion of, oh, I'm Sinhalese uh, Sri Lankan, or I'm Tamil Sri Lankan, and, you know, how do we recognize this um, protest um, as choreography of <coughs> resistance? Um, and that's what this performance was sort of all about. Mm. My chance? No. <laughs> <laughs> actually, um, I'm not a dancer, actually. These are dancers, fabulous dancers we have here, and they are as well. 
I'm not a dancer. My background is theatre and I'm an actor, both theatre and films, and now I'm working at the university. And most of these young dancers actually coming from my department, Department of uh, Drama and Contemporary Dance. Um, and uh, we have been collaborating with uh, Ninsen University, particularly the dance department, um, through Professor Sandra. And, and then we built up a lot of other you know, linkages between other faculty members as well. They have been to our university a couple of times, students and uh, faculty members as well. So um, now we are stepping into a very fragile and complex uh, subject area that we have been touching. Um, the coloniality, uh, the power, authority, etc., etc. I want to share a little, uh, <clears throat> little story, actually. Now, as you can see, we are here, finally, uh, with ten uh, dancers from Sri Lanka. But this has been a really a very difficult uh, task for all of us to come to America, USA. Mm -hmm. Basically, the problem is the visa. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what is this politics? What is this authority? What is this uh, institutionalization around us? We have, because there are many times. There are many times. Most of our, your your academics and students came to my university. We didn't ask why you are coming, and what is your problem. So we welcome them. Even in the future, we welcome them. But the the mission at in Colombo. USA mission, they ask us lots of problems, and they even didn't uh, allow most of our, uh, you know, academics as well as uh, students to come to Sri Lanka. And they were holding their, uh, you know, passport for weeks, asking so many questions, and even the, I was questioned many times, and you know, that was not a pleasant uh, thing. So what I am saying is. This is this is neoliberal, uh, you know, atmosphere, neoliberal, uh, uh, you know, economy uh, that is uh, dominating all over the world, and that this politics is there. So it is not just, uh, you know, you know, the inside. Uh, it is not just nationalism, uh, which is uh, problematic in in our lands, but but there are so many other. Suppressions, oppressions uh, going on. So, as artists, uh, we need to be very much aware of all these issues because my I, I have a, a theatre history and and uh, I can tell you so many stories related to you know uh, um, uh, politics, uh, nationalistic issues that we have throughout this history in Sri Lanka as well as you know as artists. Even my father is an artist, he as an actor, playwright, and a director. Even in 1960s, since 1960s, we have been experiencing so many, uh, you know, uh, issues related to censorship and problems. Even as an actor, uh, I have experienced so many uh, problems because I was doing a lot of uh, movies, <coughs> which even in, in two th around 2000, uh, which were based on, uh, you know, the ethnic issue in in our country, and so. Uh, these, these problems are um, everywhere. So, as artists and and uh, you know dancers, theatre uh, theatre activists and performers, we we need to get together and work uh, hard to you know express our views and uh, to make this um, environment a better environment for all of us. So, yeah, the, over to you. Uh, I will <laughs> try. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, of course, uh, am not a performer myself, so uh, I don't have any direct uh, input on this. Um, I do have a few questions of my own. Shall uh, I open up to another one? Please. Um, so one of the questions uh, that I have has to do with um, uh, my work is on uh, the history of the British Empire, specifically in India, so a little displaced from Sri Lanka, but one of... Um, the issues with dance and uh, um, the British in India is the rapid um, and kind of radical transformation of the position that dancers occupy in society um, in uh, colonial spaces. And from what I understand, there's a similar transformation of who is a dancer and what uh, position dancers occupy in Sri Lankan society as well <coughs> under colonial rule. And what I was wondering is, um, uh, 
how that has, uh, if you could talk a little bit about kind of the social position of dance uh, today and of dancers and artists uh, in Sri Lanka um, and how that has sort of challenged some of the strictures of colonial, of the colonial era. Uh, oh. We have been discussing about some of the issues related to this traditional dance even in the afternoon. Uh, I, I suppose yeah. because that's why I'm 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 saying that it's very fragile area of study because you know uh, as you you have already witnessed that we did a lot of uh, so-called traditional dance forms mm -hmm. at the same time there were a lot of uh, contemporary uh, dance forms that are our traditional dancers you know, traditionally trained dancers uh, did today as well right and mm -hmm. um, the problem is actually. Even for us, it is it is very difficult um, for us to you know handle the idea of tradition mm. uh, because you know it, it it can be interpreted in various ways and it's very fragile and even even you know even me uh, as a as a Sri Lankan I I don't know whether I, I represent a particular tradition now because it's it's been a lot of you know it's been a lot of you know hybridized uh, kind of uh, uh, tradition we have it's there's no single identity there are many narratives uh, discourses around it as well so you cannot find a purity in 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 these dance actually as uh, he said, I also agree to that. Yeah, actually, like yeah, the, um, as, as I said, so like uh, the Krishna's question is like re really important because to sh because to see the complexities of the histories, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's not like uh, you know the the dancers, <coughs> you know, like on one hand, like you know, I was in this uh, uh, shoe as well. At one point, I thought like, okay, so the colonialism has done very bad thing to us. And like, you know, I was like angry at some point, but then, but it's it's more complex than that because um, because for example, like when you see the the what the what, what the dancers have gone through during the colonial pre-colonial period and the colonial period and the post-colonial time. Um, so on one level, the you know the in pre-colonial times the dancers were the the society was very you know caste based. The, the dancers were considered very low caste, uh, so therefore and the, drummers as well. Yeah, the dancers mm -hmm. and drummers. So when, when I, yeah, so when I say dancers, actually da, da, traditional dancers, drummers, and musicians yeah. altogether. Yeah. So so they, there was very social, like very lack of social mobility for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but what the colonialism <laughs> brought them was like the social mobility, so they they could go to different occupations and they they could come to although they were brought to. European colonial exhibitions and exhibited them as objects, but some of them uh, decided to stay in the Europe mm. uh, because they, they never went back to Sri Lanka because their their life was better because you know the, than the caste discrimination there. So therefore, that level of mobility o w was also w something open for the dancers. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the in the pre-colonial times, so da dancers had a particular place in society. When the, 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 that system was collapsed, so then dancers did not have that place in the society. So they had to, uh, you know, for example, there's a particular case, the, uh, the, one of the dancers in, in the Candian court, uh, like uh, his descendant, had to work in a tea industry, uh, the, the tea factory. So, because the because the now the colonial economy was driven to like more like a, uh, the plantation economy, so the traditional dancers could not perform anymore. They had to work, uh, you know, they had to earn a living from working for a tea, tea state. Mm. So, so there was like this complex mm. changes happen, um, you know, uh, within the colonial times. Mm. Interesting. Um, I think that there's a similar history. With, in, in Tamil communities about uh, with caste exploitation of dancers and drummers and musicians. Um, and, uh, you know, now um, currently Tamil communities in Sri Lanka and in the diaspora are, um, you know, Bhatnatyam has become mm -hmm. um, a form that is dominant 
um, within the community and, and is also a form that I um, have been influenced and engaged. I haven't been classically trained in Bhaktanathiyam, but I'm, I engage with it and um, uh, uh, am, uh, you know, influenced by it. And, and for that reason, I also have to give thanks to Balasarasati and to the Devadasi dancers and those who pass on the the um, ancient traditions and the histories. Um, but then what, but you know, uh, what happened with Rukmini Devi and the, um, there was a Brahmanization of Bhatnatyam and mm. that also took away the erotic. And so, um, and that uh, abandoned uh, the Devadasis, you know, in that, in that. Um, so, um, I, I think about like what is my responsibility to make amends for uh, that history and in, in my own work. And, um, and that's where some of this imaginings and then honorings and recognition of the Devadasi dancers and the temple dancers and those who were exploited, subjugated, erased from um, the dance history. And now, especially in the Tamil diaspora, Bharatnatyam has become like a class status, uh, it has become mm -hmm. a, um, a, a caste status, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's very expensive to do an Arangatrum, you know, my, my cousin did an, an Arangatrum, she's, uh, you know, left Sri Lanka as a refugee, she, you know, graduated school, went to work, lived at home while she worked so she could save money so that she could put on this 20,000 pound Aaron Gatrum, you know, and it even if they don't continue it, after, it's just sort of like this milestone that people just want to achieve yeah. sometimes for the sake of it. The, I mean, for, in my cousin's case, she believed in the craft and she, it was really, so that she lived at home for two and a half years so that, what, you know, that means not having a boyfriend, that means not, you know, all these kind of things that she's professional, she could be living in London, blah, blah, blah. But she was just like, no, you know, I really want to do this. But in, mm. for many people, People, it's almost like, you know, you know, you're 18 years old. You're, you know, they see it as marriageable age. It's almost like uh, debutante coming out to society, you know, um, and something that like people, you know, is showing off wealth. And I think that really has, um, you know, removed us from, uh, you know, the, the. Um, some of the uh, it's removed us deeply from the history you know of how these because i understand dance as a passing of history a passing on of culture and not that we should adopt it all but a, a passing on of history that we engage with that we're in conversation with that we say yes this is something um i believe in and then this is something that needs to change it's dynamic culture is dynamic i am also creating for the future so hopefully perhaps i i ask that i may leave a record for a hundred years from now you know so that um that and that other people can reflect and think and be and hopefully if humanity will evolve our descendants will be so much wiser and they'll be like ah yalani was so old school you know and she just you know there were so many things she just didn't see you know she was so conservative but you know these things that's cool you know we're gonna take this on and we're gonna you know so you know uh i i think you know and i this this feeling of like um, dance is still something that's low caste, you know, or you know, backwards, or um, and something that's easy to that people just normalize the exploitation of. Mm -hmm. I still feel um, is something that I've witnessed within Tamil community, mm -hmm. you know. So it comes down to even like. Do you pay dancers? Do you pay drummers? Do you, um, you know, like, what is the expectation? And that's even from, like, you know, because ultimately da many of our artistic traditions are very much a part of, like, our lives, right? So it's also funerals. It's also, you know, life events, you know? It's, um, you know, weddings and things like that. And people... I, I still see the exploitation of our artists in our community, even though, you know, Bhatnatyam has become like this high caste, mm. you know, thing. Mm. So. And I think, um, like, with all these experiences that have happened, I'm actually, I see dance where people actually say, 
dancers don't need to be paid. You know, they're actually looked down upon where they're saying, oh, it's just for entertainment. There's nothing intellectual about it. There's nothing, you know, more to it than pretty much entertainment. And so where I grew up, that's how they look at dance. And it's still looked at, like, even, um, you know, I, I was recently a part of the Arts Council, which is part of the government. Um, and the first thing to be sort of eliminated was dance. You know, they didn't see the importance of it as much mm. as the other arts. And I think, you know, theater has a greater voice more mm. than dance, and that's probably because, you know, it's through movement. So people don't respect it as much. Mm. And so that's what sort of has been my experience, you mm. know, going back to Sri Lanka. I think that's even the case in the European history as yeah. well, like yeah. you know, European dance history. Mm -hmm. mm. I want to pick up on what Somia mentioned about this, this struggling with this notion of tradition. And, and uh, Yelani also mentioned a little bit about it, but if you may, I want to hear what sort of your relationship with this notion of tradition is, how you struggle with it, how you cope with it, because both of you, uh, both uh, Umesh and Sudesh, deal with that so-called tradition. We artificially created this di distinction between traditional dance and contemporary dance, but you engage both realms. How do you struggle with, sort of cope with this notion of tradition in, in your performance as an artist, choreographer, and as a dancer? Um. Yeah, okay, so that's a very, very difficult question for me. Mm. Because, you know, um, I grew up in Kandy, where, where this Kandyan dance is, was originated. Like, you know, the, the, the heritage of Kandyan dance, the traditional families were there. And so my first dance teacher was like a traditional, you know, dancer. And, and so most of my dance teachers were ritual practitioners. Mm. So they, mm. you know, they were not like just stage performers, but they were like, really practicing rituals and they are still doing it. So therefore they believe in it. So therefore um, when I had to you know, kind of work with the tradition and kind of um, you know, uh, deconstruct tradition, it's, it's a really difficult task for me. Mm -hmm. However, I, I see also the prejudices of the tradition as well. You know, the, the tradition, as you said, like, there's no like, specific like, um, uh, solidified thing as tradition. So it's a kind mm -hmm. of accumulated movement, right? So, uh, like, a force. So therefore, I, I have many critique of the tradition as well. So therefore, the way I uh, like to see tradition uh, as a spiritual frame, mm. right? Uh, so, you know, we have this co concept called Kalyan uh, like noble friend, spiritual friend. So, the, what the noble friend would do is, like, if your friend is doing something wrong, you would point out and say, okay, this is wrong. Mm. So uh, please don't do that and I won't do that. Mm. And if the friend is doing something good, like, okay, this is good, let's do mm. it. So, mm. so I want to have this relationship with you know, the tradition as a noble friend. Noble friend, that's a great <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> Umeshi, what is um, this? For me, it's not that difficult. Also because I think I come from a privileged background to say that I was able to experience both Kandyan dance, Bharatanatyam, and ballet growing up. Mm. So as a result, for me, you know, even if I wanted to merge all three styles, I did, um, unknowingly and knowingly sometimes. Mm. Um, so even when I'm creating work, I don't sort of like have this dual sort of like, oh, tradition, where do I cross boundaries, where do I not? Because for me, it all just depends on the concept or this idea that I have in mind, and if mm. that calls for tradition and con uh, tradition to be sort of you know crossed with contemporary, then that's what it's going to be. Mm. Um, and if it doesn't call for that, it just calls for the traditionalism to be really fully investigated. Then that's what I will yeah. go for. I so I don't think you know. For me, I'm lucky in that way that I've had that kind of perspective growing up, and it's more privileged. I know not many people have that, mm. um, you know, sort of um, perspective. I see. Mm. If I react to that uh, question, actually, as an actor, um, uh, performer, actually, um, I think uh, this this problem has been there in in, in the history of uh, theatre as well, because so many theatre directors and uh, theorists uh, um, have been influenced by a lot of Asian uh, corporeal traditions, mm. dance, drama, mm. and other ritualistic practices. And they had this question: how how we could you know 
um, uh, adapt some of the elements of traditions to develop uh, new forms of theatre or new form of corporalities. Mm. But uh, even as an actor, this is what I have been experiencing because I, I always uh, I, I, I want to you know, eliminate my sedimentation of, of my body. Um, I think the, the tradition is a kind of sedimentation that you have, even 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 though you don't don't practice a particular tradition. Being a social being in a society for a long time uh, is a kind of you know practicing a tradition. So uh, unconsciously or consciously, you are being uh, trained to. To represent a particular tradition, mm. the way you live your life, the way you eat, the way you walk, and the way you you know talk, and the language as well. So all the, these things are things are embedded in the language, and and the problem of a performer is yeah. to get rid of these uh, sedimentation and finding your own 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 self, mm. uh, which is a kind of metaphysical question again. Uh, you know uh, how to find that that zeroness in in you as a performer. Uh, so this is an ongoing question for me as well. Mm. Yes. Um, so thank you guys um, so much, and my students also thank you because this will definitely help you with the uh, response you need to write. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one question that I have has to do with, um, in the course of uh, your conversations, you've mentioned so many different settings in which dancing takes place, um, whether in this kind of performance, uh, in ritual contexts, in um, more um, uh, socially oriented or you know uh, milestones, sort of markers, and that kind of thing. And I wonder um, if you can uh, talk a little bit about bringing this into the conversation of sort of the politics of the dances. Um, how do these different contexts, um, uh, how do they require kind of different approaches, um, or um, uh, how do you sort of navigate between the different uh, sort of functions of dance? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Dances? Yeah, what do you think? <laughs> so, uh, I, I use performance, and this performance in particular, um, actively from like it, it evolved it's, it, it's a, an evolving uh, work body of work and it uh, but from like 2000 through 2010 I was even I, I should say 2014 I was on a particular kind of mission to open space and use performance to do that um, so, um, specifically, when I started having more uh, consciousness and commitment to a more pluralistic Tamil politic and a higher standard for liberation for our peoples and what had been dictated to us, I and you know, really just I I started um, engaging the Tamil diaspora, and, um, especially because they were funding. Uh, armed actors on the ground, and so um, and I it was very difficult to do that. There's very narrow space, and I was consistently warned, Yalini, if you come out as both critical of the state and the tigers, you're marked. You're going to be slandered. You're going to be shut down. You're going to lose access to all spaces. You're not even going to be able to go back to the north and east. So, you know, so that was consistently what people who cared about me, who were older than me, said. They were like, Yalani, you know, they're like, Yalani, you're so sweet. You don't want to put yourself in this position. And <laughs> was uh, was kind of the vibe, you know. Um, and I was like, no, I, but I have a responsibility now. Now that I know things, I can't unknow things. And so p performance became, before, when I first started this kind of, this work, there was no cell phones, right? Like, 
it wasn't very ac accessible. It wasn't like people could record what I was saying. So I felt like through performance, if I wrote things, it's a record. It's something that's permanent. It's something that can be torn apart, that can be um, you know, spread. But through performance, it's about that moment, those people in the room. And I used performance as a catalyst to open conversations. So that's how it first began. It was to facilitate conversations, to be able to open people with in different spaces to think differently, to, to imagine, to want something more. Yeah. And um, then I went and I was, um, I was doing work in the refugee camps in Tamil Nadu, so where, when the war had restarted. So during ceasefire, I was really trying to tackle the diaspora, um, especially people my age who were suddenly like from the dot-com boom, investment banking, suddenly had money and were sending money back home. And so then I uh, started, um, uh, I, 2006, 7, 8, um, I went into the refugee camps in Tamil Nadu, which as a U.S. citizen you're not supposed to do, so I snuck, snuck in. And I uh, facilitated and performed and, um, and listened and learned there. And when I, when I was present with people who were leaving the island from the war and having to face that reality, then my politic really strengthened. And then I felt like I need to not just facilitate conversations, I need to actually express my perspective and, um, and share these stories. The way my, so as performance had to be something that I was ready, I, uh, so the, every, the dance that you see is all structured improv. And I, improvisation is extremely important to my practice aesthetic, in part because I, had, I was sneaking into these spaces that I wasn't permitted in to. I was inviting people into conversations they weren't allowed to have about, um, and you know what's so, uh, not in my own family, my family had a, had, still has serious problems with my queerness, but in these Tamil spaces, I got more backlash, it was more risky for me to critique the tigers and, and then it was to be open about my sexuality. People were like, okay, she's gay, whatever. You know, but like, um, but I mean, I'm not in all spaces. I mean, sometimes there was a security risk around queerness too, so then I would, you know, be more um, a metaphoric and less explicit. And so, uh, but in the diaspora, it was, uh, in the Western diaspora, not in the Indian diaspora, the, the conversations around sexuality wasn't as big of a deal as the conversations around nationalism. Mm. And then, um, and then when I would go into the ref when I was going into refugee camps, and then later I was going into resettlement uh, villages in the north and east. I mean, I I I needed to be able to perform anywhere, anytime, whenever it was called upon me, and I needed to be able to ship the performance depending on who walked into the room. So if an army person walked into the room, I needed to shift and we were suddenly doing exercises and breathing exercises and this is just, you know, and it's not a performance. And you know, so it, it uh, or it, you know, we're doing vocalization and or what have you, you know. So um, it, I wasn't able to get a, a permanent public performance in Sri Lanka during like that time, during the 2006 um, you know, to 2014 time. But I was able to perform in living rooms. I was able to perform in resettlement villages. I was able to perform at community organizations, at universities, at uh, people who were willing to take a risk and people who didn't have a problem being out, you know, like, um, you, know, uh, you know, folks who were already at risk. They'd already put themselves out there. They were already out against all of these things. And they were like, Galani, whatever, come do this. I don't care. We already break the rules. Come here. You know, and um, churches even. Uh, my family, I was raised Catholic um, also. That's another part of the decolonial process. Um, and... Uh, so, but that means my family connections were like I would be staying when I went to the north and east. That means I was staying in the convents. I was staying, you know. Um, so I I performed everywhere from churches to convents to to villages to everything, and that really has informed my aesthetic. Um, and I I actually feel like performing solo is more of an economic and political condition than actually what I desire and want as an artist. I'm much more I'm very much a collaborative person. I like ensemble work, but the political and economic conditions were something that 
ended up shaping this as a solo work. Mm. Uh, do you have time for I mean, yeah. maybe yeah. audience? Maybe. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Shall we open it? Yeah. yeah. They Please. might have. So one of the key themes of uh, all the performances were, uh, was uh, collaboration, and that's that's it's in the all of this collective uh, aspect. Uh, so in, in Sri Lanka, we have two camps, even after war, uh, there's this uh, specific violence uh, between a pro-nationalist group of artists, and then artists who are critical of that, artists who subvert the tradition of that. Uh, so what techniques would you deploy? I mean, this, this spans a, a broad spectrum, not just the, uh, the theater people, the filmmakers, uh, and, uh, other artists, writers who are affiliated with the government, uh, and then those who are critical of it who receive the backlash all the time. So what techniques would you deploy uh, to encourage collaboration between these two camps, uh, mm. and, and, and have you been successful? Uh, and related to that, uh, uh, yeah, in dream, uh, your work, even though you perform solo, your work is inspired by collaborative work, and uh, your investments are very much pan-ethnic, um, mm -hmm. Side. I ah, just okay. spoke a lot. <laughs> so yeah, yeah you side and then I'll respond. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll remember. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so um, thank you for the question, but it's a difficult, very difficult question. But, um, uh, but I can say my personal approach to, you know, that, that how, to, how to address this, you know, this two different parties and like what could be the possible, um, you know, way to collaborate with both uh, and come to terms with both. Um, for me, uh, this seems like religious, but it's deep listening, and and again, like working with people, and like f for me, uh, you know, this is my personal practice in in every other thing as well, not just art art practice. Um, I don't believe in confrontations. Like when I say confrontations, like uh, no, I, I would say conflict, right? Um, Confrontation, you, you might need confrontation, but um, conflicts, uh, I think, would not help. Like, so for me, like, really, uh, you know, this idea of interdependence, interbeing, right? Like, um, so, you know, um, you know I, I really, uh, you know, I was following, uh, you know, this uh, Vietnamese Buddhist monk, Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, so he, he um, uh, he, he, he is a poet as well, so he has this notion of like, so we are not just being, we are interbeings. So what you do is affecting me and what I do is affect you. So, it's, so therefore, so when I approach any kind of political debate of like, you know, this kind of uh, like very divided, polarized situations, um, I always try to hear the other, other side and, and uh, you know, try to understand that. And then, but I have a, I have a purpose. And I have my goal as well, but then, but I I try to come to a negotiation and and, and then try to find answers. So that's how I, I, I approach my artwork as well. Mm. Yeah, um, so this uh, idea of interbeing, uh, uh, I see it as a kind of phenomenological idea. Um, so I, in my mind, I have another similar. Um, uh, it resonates uh, and uh, connects with another similar idea called intersubjectivity. So the collaboration is always uh, is, is always uh, that we try to 
try to, um, you know, try to connect with uh, uh, other uh, beings, human beings, and develop, uh, you know, our artistic practice. So, in terms of theatre and films back in Sri Lanka, theatre mainly it has been a, a heavily a collaborative process throughout the, the history. And um, uh, in terms of bringing those opponents into a kind of, you know, uh, 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 agreement, and, and uh, is, is a difficult task again. Um, but, you know, um, there are so many different artists and art practices even in, back in Sri Lanka. You know, it's a very complex society now. Um, there are so many different ways of practicing arts. And so there are so many um, artists as well. So we have to find out the role of the artist uh, in our society as well, you know. So we, we, we might need to go back to, the, to those roots and, you know, finding out the, 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 the real meanings of, uh, of becoming an artist as well. Mm -hmm. So th there are so many problems, I think, uh, even in, in our society at the moment, because, you know, many, I mean, there are many ways of doing art, arts practices and there are so many different um, artists and um, even, for instance, now in theatre, nowadays, the most most uh, uh, popular form of theatre is, uh, you know, uh, uh, this called uh, this theatre called um, uh, forum theatre, that kind of theatre. Why, you know, there are there are money coming into into Sri Lanka from NGOs and from other institutions, and some of the so-called artists they gather and they get this money and they do a lot of. Um, forum theatre for the sake of social transformation. So that this policy is there, you know, like now we, we believe that we can change the society, uh, you know, in, in a very short period of time, <laughs> or, you know. So that kind of policy is there, even in, in some theatre practi practices. So we, they have money and they, they took very shallow, you know, they took some, some of the concepts from uh, Augusto Boal and uh, then uh, they know nothing about Augusto Boal and they, they uh, you know, tomorrow they have this forum theatre. Mm. They perform something else on the stage and ask some question from the audience and, you know, then they finish their forum theatre. And they think that the, the society has already been changed. It is not, you know, there are so many, it is exploitation, again, mm. you know, in theatre. So there are that kind of so many shallow practices happening. Even, even the story behind filmmaking is also similar to that as well. So we, we really need to look at, um, we really need to find out who are really engaged with theatre and what they are doing and what are their, their philosophies, ambitions and, and so on. So these are the things that I have in my mind, actually, at the moment. Um, yes, Shal. Uh, um, yeah. um, and then I think, Umeshi, you probably have a lot to mm -hmm. offer as far as collaborative processes as well. Um, the uh, facilitating creative collaborative uh, processes is also a very important part of my artistic and political practice. Mm -hmm. So, um, and actually I said solo, but really was I solo? Because Matthew was also collaborating with me and he, he designed, so shout out to Matthew because we just met three days ago and <laughs> two days ago, I don't know how many days ago. Uh, I got here Wednesday night, we rehearsed on Thursday, so two days ago, I guess. Uh, or, yesterday. Oh, yesterday. <laughs> yesterday. We met yesterday. No, even even these dancers collaborated. I, I mean, in yeah, a very yeah. short period yeah, of time. Very short period. Yeah, very short period. Umesh's work and uh, yeah. yeah, Bridget and you know other dancers from Denison. They mm -hmm. collaborated in this yeah. project. Yeah, so, I mean, yes, yeah, so, so uh, Matthew, this was unique, you know, you probably will never see it again because uh, Matthew designed this specifically and improvised it, you know, for this performance. Um, and so I, I 
I do believe that, so right now we are at a time that I think is really interesting because social media has allowed, when, when it first hit in these new technologies, it advanced the sharing of information and um, heightened people's ability, especially younger people's ability, to be able to diagnose a problem. So suddenly we have ideas that maybe have been more obscure that are now reaching a more mainstream. So we saw that with uh, Black Lives Matter, we saw that with Arab Spring, we've seen that you know, across the board in different, in different aspects. Um, but what I feel like has also diminished, especially as social media got manipulated by corp, I mean, I, it was never a public forum. It was a myth of meritocracy. Um, it's a privatized space that was driven towards advertisement and profit and then was manipulated by social political forces that have also contributed to communal violence in Sri Lanka as well as in other places. And so what we've also seen is this kind of conflict that is a destructive conflict that has been um, amplified and encouraged on social media. And through that, we've also lost and diminished some of the skills that we need for true uh, political transformation and societal transformation. I believe deeply in um, building people's power, uh, dignity, um, uh, a, 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 a spiritual as well as collective um, um, claiming of dignity and sharing of information that supports people and being able to shift the conditions that impact their lives. So collaboration, and then also my end game is not just reparations for the ways in which uh, peoples have been harmed. Um, I think that is an important part, you know, reconciliation, reparations, truth telling is a very important part of the process. But my end game is sovereignty. My end game is um, governance for all. My end game is living in a society that is centered around creativity and nourishment and care uh, versus um, uh, societies that are, uh, and economies that are centered around extraction and exploitation and violence. And so collaboration to me is a very um, important uh, skill that we need in order to be able to, uh, to govern ourselves and to have sovereignty. So um, what, when you collaborate, you have to be able to navigate disagreement. You have to be able to have generative conflict. You have to be able to take different perspectives and be able to move towards a solution that, uh, uh, that, that meets multiple visions. Um, and I, so for me, I, I find uh, that process of collaboration really important. <coughs> collaboration and solidarity are practices that I see um, uh, that are fundamental to liberation and sovereignty. And so, um, you know, yeah, I, I'll leave it at that. And I don't know, um, um, actually, if you want to I mean, add. for me, collaboration is important because, I mean, we live in a globalized world where we're constantly shared by so many forces and so many people. Um, and for me, as an educator, it's really important for me that, I mean, my work, I'm not inspired without the choices and the people in the room. Um, I think when you're creating something, you know, there's no point having a singular sort of view on it. Um, all our bodies come with memories and experiences, and I think it's really important to identify individual sort of strengths and experiences and create a piece collectively, even if I'm the choreographer. Um, it's important for me that collaboratively we're creating something together as all these bodies are representing that piece and not just me and my sort of, you know, views and thoughts. Um, as an educator, I also try, I mean, one of the things I moved back to Sri Lanka is to ensure that, you know, we can bridge these differences across class, across religion, across ethnicity. And so for me, in my pieces, I love ensemble work because it's a way for me to bring different groups of people together um, and use movement to sort of be able to speak on behalf of all of us. Mm. Um, and all these groups that, I mean, all these people, I mean, the way, why I wanted to even bring Denison students into this piece is that, is that idea of like the importance of, you know, how movement can really help bring people together, um, regardless of where they're from, regardless of the ability to be able to speak the same language. Um, and I think at this day and age, without collaboration, it's very difficult for humanity to progress. I think. You know, yes, we need to um, push for individu individuality, but at the same time, we need to push for a collective sort of appreciation of diversity and one another, and collaboration is the way to do that. I just want to like, add something. Uh, you know, the, you already remind me the, the missing word that I was looking for, uh, really, transformation. So I, I mm -hmm. also really believe in transformation, and also I, 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 and also I, I feel like it's very important to 
you know, emphasis emphasize on the process, not just the product. Like you know, yeah. even like the you know, just what you see on the stage is like, oh, in a performance space, it's it's only only one thing. But but I I'm someone who who really emphasize on the process. Like yeah. you know, get together people and like you know, like for example, like you know, one time like we were like commissioned to. Uh, do a, like a cultural performance, multicultural performance, uh, in uh, like uh, 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 like a refugee camp where the uh, LTTE like child soldiers were being held, and then I said this is like a government organization, and then I said like a multicultural show would not do anything. So if you allow us to go there and like you know work with them listen to them and see what they want to show like then that's that's where I, I, I would want to work and you know luckily they, they agreed and so so the, that's why I think the process like listening is really really important for me. Any question? Yes, Sorry, can you just speak a little louder, if oh, you don't mind? Sorry. Response. Do you yeah, have yeah. Response? Okay. So, um, so uh, my understanding uh, of the history is that uh, Rukmini Devi, when um, is one of the people who kind of um, re, re I don't want to vitalize, you know, like um, Bharatanatyam as like a national Indian dance. And when Ruk, what happened was Rukmini Devi, um, who's a from a Brahmin uh, family, went to, uh, I think, Australia, she, or France. I think she went to France and was like... Uh, she studied Ruk, ballet. Right. She studied ballet, yeah, and was like, you know, we need a classical art form like ballet. Mm. And so... Um, then yes, yeah, so she so then she went and she studied with Bala Saraswati, and um, and who is a David Dasi dancer who also was you know traveling um, uh, trans internationally. And I I think um, Sudesh, what you brought up about the complications of colonization and caste is really um, important to think about as well because. There was both caste assimilation and also caste mo and social mobility that uh, people who had been historically exploited were able to access under um, colonization, and um, that's an important part that, of co colonial history and decolonization that we need to um, be mindful of and aware of. But things are nuanced, right? So um, then, when when Rukmini Devi, Rukmini Devi wanted to, so at that time, uh, Bharnatyam or um, 
you know, it, it wasn't called Bharatanatyam uh, historically, it, it be, was renamed that, um, was looked down upon as something um, that was base. In, Shall I add yeah, something yeah, to that? Yeah, please. So just before that period, like during the British colonial time, so they, uh, they banned the, you know, the, the Devadasi tradition. Yeah. So like they, they were kind of uh, like criminalized the Devadasi tradition. So therefore, so it was really looked down upon then 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 that's when the Rukmani Devi Arundel like you know yes. took this role to kind of elevate the, the, the art yeah art part and part of making it respectable was right. taking out the sexuality that was also um, that was also part of why colonization you know a British colonial rule mm -hmm. criminalized the art form mm -hmm. um, because of the erotic nature historically of the dances. So that is, you know, a huge part of, and, and some, you know, that influences how we see Bharatanatyam today. And Chandraleka definitely um, challenged that and uh, was, um, you know, in conversation uh, with Rukmini Devi and also, you know, critical of this, you know, removing the erotic and then also this uh, caste co-optation you know, so people often talk about Rukmini Devi having like made this dance accessible to all castes, but um, I think we have to we have to uh, be a little bit more critical of that. Um, it, it it was uh, a caste that had a much more power that was able to um, co-opt these traditions, and create a, a respectable form of it, and then did not. Uh, you know, in the tradition, we we are supposed to give honor to our teachers and respect, and anybody who has passed that on on a spiritual level. Like we have to honor those who allow for us to be able to do what it is that we do today. And so, to me, it's disrespectful that um, that 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 if you dance about it and you're not in solidarity with um, exploited caste and against the caste system, to me, that's just disrespectful. And um, so the so and also what you've named so there's economic forces there's also nationalistic forces there's exoticization there's the marketing of bad Natyam in the west you know that's an uncomplicated um, spreading of that dance form um, and that's not to say that there isn't still beautiful things to learn from the form. I mean, uh, dancers, Bala Saraswati and, uh, and the other Devadasi dancers, they have passed on a history to us that I think is very important to listen to and engage to, and it's a very important form. But we, can't, we have to look at it wi within a context. Mm. We are actually way past the time that we had <laughs> promised to end. So, so one last round of applause for that. <laughs>